Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Bullard, and I direct the Environmental Justice Resource Center at Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, for the last 30 years, I've worked on issues uh, at the intersection of race, environment, and health. And I think it's important to understand for some people uh, in the room that this is not, uh, this is historic to have all these cabinet members uh, come together and to uh, reinvigorate and uh, restart the environment, the uh, interagency working group. But uh, some of us who are in here with gray hair remember this is a little uh, deja vu all over again. We were here in 94 uh, talking about some of the same issues, confronting some of the same concerns, and I think it's important that we take it to the next level. Um, in looking at the, listening to the last panel that was talking about green jobs, um, I think it's important to understand that there are some of us who have um, operated and directed a green jobs program for at least 16 years. Uh, I'm giving kudos to the uh, National Institutes of Environmental Health, their minority worker training program, uh, and the interaction and the relationship that it has had with uh, impacted communities and and uh, historically black college and university training programs and other institutions. So let's be mindful of history as we make history. It's my pleasure and, and distinct honor to introduce uh, the next uh, cabinet member uh, speaker, uh, Secretary Cat, uh, Kathleen Sebelius. Um, she was sworn in as the 21st Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services in April of 2009, um, and she oversees uh, one of the largest civilian departments in the federal government, n nearly 80,000 employees. Uh, since taking office, uh, Secretary Sebelius has been a leader in some of uh, President Obama's uh, top priorities. Uh, as the country's leading and highest ranking health official, uh, she is guiding the implementation of the Historic, uh, Affordable, uh, Historic Affordable Care Act. In 2010, uh, she was uh, named by uh, Modern Healthcare as America's uh, second most powerful person in healthcare. Uh, Secretary, under Secretary Sebelius' leadership, HHS has played a key role in the administration's aggressive response to the economic downturn, helping families stay on their feet by providing healthcare, job training, childcare, and energy assistance. Uh, for for over 20 years, um, Secretary Sebelius, working um, in the area, has made her mark. And in 2005, Time Magazine recognized her achievements by naming her one of America's top five governors. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Kathleen Sebelius. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for that warm welcome. Um, if you think that counts as your afternoon exercise, <laughs> get over it. It doesn't. Uh, but I am delighted to have a chance to join you here today, and I want to thank Dr. Bullard for that nice introduction, uh, but more than that, for his incredible leadership on a number of these important issues. He's been at this work for decades, and I think the fact that he is um, here helping to lead this important gathering is a tribute to the fact that um, the mission is not yet completed. Uh, I think it's also noticeable that you've had about half the cabinet here in and out, and it's not just because Nancy Sutley and Lisa are very convincing, um, tenacious, I would say, uh, but it also, I think, is, is a tribute to the years of hard work that leaders like Dr. Bullard and many of you advocates in the room today um, have been about, about how environmental justice affects all of us and is a key priority. Now, environmental justice hasn't necessarily been part of the traditional lexicon at HHS, uh, particularly in recent years. But 
I'm glad we're here today, and I'm glad with uh, Lisa's leadership and the commitment from all of us, uh, we are very pleased to join this effort. We have the frame at HHS that uh, there is nothing more important than health, that health is freedom. When we live longer, healthier lives, we have more time to do our jobs, we have more time to volunteer in our neighborhoods, to play with our children, to watch our grandchildren grow up. And health is also one of the key foundations for our country's prosperity. We know that healthy adults are more productive workers, that healthy children are better students, and that healthy families can make more significant contributions to their communities. Um, but today, I think we understand much more than ever that health is not just about determining what happens in a doctor's office or in an operating room. It doesn't happen um, only around the medical profession. Uh, health is largely determined by where you live, where you work, where you go to school, where you play, what you eat and drink, the air you breathe, and how you get around. And we understand that all of those environmental factors are also at the root of many of our most significant health disparities. So we know that there are huge steps we can take to improve health that really have nothing to do with treating an illness or an injury, uh, nothing to do with the new medicine that people take. Uh, it could be bringing a supermarket to a low-income neighborhood so that families have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. It could be redesigning that neighborhood to make it more walkable so that there's less car pollution, which can often make asthma far worse. Could be prohibiting smoking in public places so that people aren't surrounded uh, by secondhand smoke. Uh, those can be some of the most effective health strategies that we have for improving the prosperity of our country. So over the last two years, this administration and our department have taken some unprecedented steps to support those kinds of community efforts across the country. We're doing it through programs called Communities Putting Prevention to Work, which is a key part of Recovery Act investments, funding some of the most promising local strategies across the country for promoting wellness and reducing chronic disease. Over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to travel across the country and visited about a dozen of these community prevention sites, from a housing project in Chicago where uh, the residents came together to insist that there be smoke-free choices uh, for folks to live in uh, so that their kids could grow up breathing clean air, uh, to an urban farm setting in Boston where not only students are growing fresh fruits and vegetables in a huge community garden, but they're selling it in farmer's market and they also do a bring a garden to a house strategy where door to door they volunteer it to neighbors to actually help set up their own gardens. Now our hope is that these communities can become models for the rest of the country. So if you're a mayor or school principal or a neighborhood activist and want to understand how best to improve health in your school or your community or your city, we'll be able to point to the best practices that are around the country and give you very specific examples of how it changes people's behaviors. Uh, and our investment in prevention didn't stop with the Recovery Act. One of the key parts of the new health reform legislation, the Affordable Care Act, is a $15 billion prevention and public health fund that will invest in similar programs across the country, and that prevention fund grows over time. Uh, the new law also contains new community transformation grant programs that build on the economic empowerment zone models, but they're aimed at health. Using public-private partnerships, communities will be able to pursue comprehensive strategies to improve health, whether it's promoting better nutrition for kids in schools or creating safer neighborhoods where people can walk and play outside. And like empowerment zones, the grants recognize that the people who often know best how to improve community health are the people who live in those communities. So it actually gets the resources to the folks who have the most at stake, the most investment, and frankly, the most expertise. 
Now, Congress hasn't yet authorized funds for the grants, but we hope they'll follow through on one of the best investments we can make in our country's health. So with these programs, uh, we're building a healthier America, one community at a time. And it isn't easy, but as our Assistant Secretary for Health, Dr. Howard Coe, sometimes says, an ounce of prevention can take a ton of work. <laughs> but we know it can be done because communities across the country are already doing it. Now, our department also continues to support research into the connections between environment and health, especially at our National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, two very important research entities. We're putting a special emphasis on collaborating with minority communities whose health often suffers the most from environmental factors recognizing that conducting research in partnership with community residents can build on local knowledge and local skills. And I want to just give you one example. We're working closely with the Navajo Nation in New Mexico to study the possible health consequences of uranium exposure. And to further support that work, we recently awarded a $3 million grant that will allow scientists to study the link between uranium exposure and reproduction. Building those close relationships is allowing us to gain new insights into how the environment affects some of our most vulnerable communities. In our department, we understand the important connection between our environment and our country's health. That's why, for the first time ever this year, we made the social dominance of health, I'm sorry, the social, social determinants of health, a key focus of our Healthy People 2020 initiative. Uh, Healthy People 2020 provides a roadmap for how to improve the health of our nation over the next decade. And this year, the report establishes a new core goal of, and I quote, creating social and physical environments that promote good health for all. And that will put the environment at the center of the nation's health agenda. We also know that the Department of Health and Human Services and even the broader public health sector can't do this work alone. If we want to serve healthier school lunches, which is where our kids get so much of their nutrition, we need to work with the departments of agriculture and education who have key influence over school lunches. If we want to design neighborhoods where it's easier to walk or bike, we need to work with the Department of Transportation. If we want to work to create safer homes, we need to work with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And that's why each of these agencies, in addition to several others, have seats on the new Prevention Council created by the Affordable Care Act, along with me and our Chair, Surgeon General Regina Benjamin. Uh, that Prevention Council, which is designed as part of the Affordable Care Act, is working together to develop a new prevention strategy that will be released early next year. And we'll be working together to carry it out as we move forward. But if we need all these other partners at the table when we talk about improving health, we also need to have the health community at the table when we talk about urban planning or food policy or responding to an environmental disaster. We saw that earlier this year in our response to the Gulf oil spill. Whether it was food safety experts determining whether the seafood from the Gulf was safe to continue to eat, health workers providing care for the environmental workers who participated in the cleanup efforts, or mental health counselors providing care in communities devastated by the spill, health professionals were on the front line playing a critical role. And that's why our department is guided by the philosophy of health in all policies. Health in all policies means that at any time we make a decision, we should be asking what are the health consequences. And I want to point out that by building healthy communities, we're also building resilient communities. The same network of local health providers that can help you manage your diabetes should be and can be at the front line of the defense in a public health emergency. The stronger the baseline health of any individual community is, the less vulnerable they are to new health threats like we saw last year with the H1N1 flu pandemic. So the major message that I'd like to leave with you today is that our department is eager to work on these issues. 
we're eager to work with all of you. Over the last two years, we've made a conscious effort to think about health more broadly and more inclusively, both inside and outside the doctor's office. And while we'll continue to make it a priority to collaborate more effectively across the federal government, we also know that the kind of change that all of you are seeking and that we join you in seeking is often best formulated at the community level. Often the best thing we can do is to support, invest in, and publicize these best practices to help them to spread. So I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that you have been doing. Thank you for the work that you're about to do. And I know that these discussions will be productive. And I look forward to working with you to build a healthier, more prosperous country, one building, one block, one neighborhood at a time. Thanks very much. Okay, where's Nancy's stool? It's a little high, but I think I'm here. <laughs> oh, well, I could be here. That would be good. Yep, I'm, not sure. I'm moving down one. We're moving down. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So good afternoon, and thank you to um, Secretary Sebelius for her great remarks and for her, recogni her recognition that environmental justice really does start in communities and that communities need to be at the heart and soul of, of any changes that we make to improve um, community health. My name is Diane Tekforian, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Health Coalition in San Diego and Tijuana. We just celebrated our 30-year anniversary fighting for environmental justice in our region. Thanks. I also want to thank um, Nancy Sutley and Lisa Jackson, not for all of the things that we've uh, all recognized here today, but and not only for how they address environmental justice in CEQ and in EPA, but for, your, for their expansive view of how to make those changes. They're now expanding out all of our views of how to get those changes done and how to achieve environmental justice. I think that it, this, this audience does not need to be told that um, environmental justice starts where people are. Uh, it starts where people live, work, and play. And so we, we said this panel was one that where we would talk about what the relevance of environmental justice and um, healthy communities is. And I would say, how is it not relevant? I don't think that this audience needs to um, be told what the critical uh, intersections are of environmental justice and healthy communities. Um, why are place-based uh, strategies important? Because that's where we are and that's where all of us are working. Um, we need to bring the force of the federal agencies together to create healthy communities in, in all of our regions because environmental justice cannot be achieved in silos. None of us have one issue to deal with. And all of us who have achieved anything, one accomplishment, know that once you've achieved that and that you've learned uh, the lexicon of EPA or DOD or whichever agency that you are, are dealing with and the um, sources of the pollution or the sources of the problem, you know, you've exhausted yourself for a decade or more and then you need to move on to the next one. We need a more comprehensive approach that requires that the federal government and all of those agencies come together to really build quality, healthy communities for all of us. Um, we all know that in all of our communities we have excessive amounts of pollution. Um, we all know that our health is at risk. If you start in a community where um, the kids in our communities live, we have dilapidated housing and so we've got three times the rate of um, lead poisoning in our homes. And then we have three times the rate of asthma when they walk out the door because of the, uh, the mobile and source, uh, stationary source pollution. And those same homes are the ones that are the most energy, energy inefficient. So we need help in that regard. Um, 
certainly at the local level with land use planning that is clearly discriminatory, we need the fe federal government's help because someone said here that compliance is really not enough. It's not enough to have a compliant facility if it's located right next door to a home or a school. That doesn't make a difference and it's discrimination of the worst kind. Um, uh, Elizabeth said, you know, we recognize an environmental justice community um, when we see, we see one, we got that. Well, some of us don't got that. Um, so uh, we, we're getting some really good help, and I want to introduce this to you. Um, all of the issues that uh, we've talked about from health to social determinants of health um, are coming together in a really exciting new model called the Environmental Justice Screening Method, and Manuel Pastor, I think, is here, right here, um, and his team from Occidental, USC, and Berkeley are coming together to help this method be something that brings it together for all of us and for all of them who don't think that cumulative impacts really make um, a difference in all of our communities like we do. And so we're excited to use that method to identify environmental justice communities that really need the most help. And uh, our California Environmental Justice Alliance and many representatives are here today have come up with something we're calling um, green zones, um, which means that those are the communities that need to be first in line uh, for the force of the federal government and the collaboration of all of the agencies and first in line for benefits so that we can create truly quality, healthy communities um, across this nation. And we have come up with a concept paper um, that's in the back. and truly don't make me go home with a suitcase full of these, please. I'd appreciate it. So they are in the back, um, and, and we'd invite you to take a look at it and let us know how you feel this can impact um, your region. So um, we have a panel who I think is going to help us really take this conversation further about what the relationship is between place-based, healthy communities, and environmental justice. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce them all to you. We're going to use the... Um, same approach that the previous panel used and turn this right over to all of you for question and answers and those will go straight to our panelists who are Terry Adrian, Adiram, Adiram. Adiram um, uh, with HHS, uh, Eddie Bautista who is with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance and um, Rajiv Bat Batia um, with the uh, San Francisco Department of Public Health, uh, Sharunda Buchanan um, the, um, at HHS also, uh, John Jarvis with um, DOI, and Shelley Patricia, is that right? Not right. quite. Okay, uh, with HUD. So um, this is a pretty stellar panel with lots of uh, great expertise, and no one had to pronounce my last name, so um, <laughs> I guess I got it. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Can't get too hung up on that. <laughs> had the worst done to me. <laughs> so um, who has the first question? And I see that we have um, great uh, folks with the microphones on all sides of the room. Dr. Bullard. I had a question for uh, the, um, for the, uh, the feds representatives. Um, <laughs> as I said before, uh, we, were the, we were here some while ago, a decade ago, and some of us, and there were uh, environmental justice strategic plan strategies put together. Uh, I'd like to know uh, if you've located them, dusted them <laughs> off, uh, trashed them, or whatever, where you are in the process of trying to make real, build on, extend, etc., improve um, on uh, what was done, or what was not done. Which Fed goes first? <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Sharonda Buchanan. I work at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and I represent uh, not only CDC but also the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry today. And um, uh, as has been said, that uh, we were here a, a number of decades ago, and. Uh, I actually want to applaud both uh, Nancy and, and Lisa on bringing together the interagency work group on environmental justice. I think that's been the impetus for various agencies, including CDC, ATSDR, to really look back and dust off the, the old plans or, in other words, regenerate a new plan. And uh, I, for one, um, I don't know if my director is out here, Dr. Chris Portier, who's the new NCH director at, at CDC 
has said to me, Sharonda, I am committed to this. I am serious about this. And we do want to put together a plan that really advances environmental justice at the CDC and, and uh, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And he asked me just uh, recently, would you join me in this effort? And I was honored to say, yes, I will. So we've already started to put the plans together, um, to look around, to see what existed, because I think there's some good stuff in what has existed, and see how we can promote that and bring that into the 21st century. So we're committed, we're at it, we're on it. I'll jump in here. I'm uh, John Jarvis. I'm the director of the National Park Service and represent uh, the Department of Interior. And I actually think we were probably not here uh, 10 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm glad we're here at this time. Um, because you might be wondering what, uh, why the National Park Service is at a meeting about environmental justice. And I think we have a very a big role in environmental justice. Um, it's a clear uh, recognition across this country, um, one, that parks, um, not just national parks, but that we have many urban national parks here in the city of Washington, in San Francisco, and in New York, um, play a critical role in public health. And the lack of parks is a, con is a contributor to the problems of environmental justice, that there is a lack of safe parks, there's a lack of parks in the neighborhoods, um, there's the lack of, of care for those parks, um, and there are park deserts. There are communities that just don't have parks, and that's an environmental justice issue. The National Park Service can play a significant role in improving parks and helping develop parks and creating parks through a variety of the programs that we administer. But we just haven't been part of the conversation, but we're here and we're committed to being part of it now. Sure. Yeah, I'll take a shot at that. So um, I'm Shelley Potisha. I'm the director of a new office at HUD, the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities. And we've been asked or designated by Deputy Secretary Sims, who you'll see in the next panel, to be the liaison to this interagency working group on environmental justice. And I think it's, you know, you might initially kind of think, oh, you know, why the Office of Sustainability being focused on uh, environmental justice issues? And that's in part because uh, Secretary Donovan has said that we need to move our uh, approach and thinking about environmental justice into the 21st century. That we need to focus, yes, on the core aspects of exposure to uh, lead and and uh, other kinds of building materials that uh, create health problems, particularly asthma. We have a whole office that's uh, focused around that, and they're getting a, a continued and additional support from the secretary. Uh, but there's also issues around uh, exposure to um, uh, risk of disaster. That's increasingly a, you know, a big part of the role of HUD is helping folks uh, prevent uh, exposure to disaster. And there's a huge alignment of environmental justice communities that are in disaster prone areas and we need to get proactive about that. We also, though, need to look beyond uh, this sort of small, I think, small bore definition of HUD's role in environmental justice. Um, we have uh, taken a much more comprehensive view of community development to ensure that as we're investing in communities, we're creating opportunities for people to live active lives, have access to local health care options, that our formula funds are used uh, correctly in order to achieve those goals more specifically. And at a broader level, uh, the program that I direct has a new program uh, that focuses on sustainable regional planning, which uh, has an important role in uh, ensuring that we don't continue to perpetuate the disparities uh, in terms of access to job opportunities in a region, uh, that we can ensure that as communities and regions grow, that uh, folks of all races, incomes, uh, and backgrounds are able to access the opportunity in their region. So you asked about our, our strategic plan. We've looked at that. And good work was done at that time. I got to say, it was really narrow in its focus. 
And so we are actually looking at expanding that to take on more issues and infuse this work uh, more specifically into the um, performance plans throughout HUD's programs. Uh, just, can I just say uh, one thing? Yeah, I, for what it's worth, uh, as, as the sole, uh, one of the two advocates on up yes. here, um, just to reiterate, I think that the point that uh, revisiting and in some cases even creating strategic plans, uh, just keep be mindful that you know, as you guys are looking at this within your respective agencies of which you're, you know, uniquely situated to kind of deal with specific uh, impacts, uh, recognize that with this interagency uh, panel, you actually have not just the uh, opportunity, but the obligation to share those strategic plans across uh, agency lines and kind of continue breaking down the silos because as anyone here can tell you, uh, our communities cut across all your jurisdictions, you know what I'm saying? And, and to the degree that your strategic planning efforts can help inform each other's opportunities operational priorities, uh, try, try to be mindful of that. And again, uh, to, to the point, you know, clearly it's, it's a new world, right? It's a, it's a world of climate adaptation, community resiliency, and to the degree that those strategic plans even contemplated that, I'd be shocked if any did. So, uh, and the reality of climate justice for our communities cries out for that kind of, uh, of coordination. So, thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to go, just so that I don't keep looking to the left, um, I'll uh, go over here first. Hi there, I'm um, Larry Cohen. I'm from Prevention Institute, which is in Oakland and works a lot on community um, health strategy. And I think Secretary Sebelius described the work really beautifully. Um, in background to my question, I should say a lot of our work is on health inequities. And most people, when they think about health inequities, think about fixing what goes on in the medical system. In fact, behavior and environment are responsible for 70% of our health in the medical system maybe 10 to 15, healthcare maybe 10 to 15. So we're really, really talking about the community environment um, in terms of fostering good health. And I think the secretary did a beautiful job of describing what that looks like, what it means, why focus on the environment, and then kind of switched over to environmental health as though it was kind of a different issue. And in my mind, we're talking about healthy communities. I'm so glad to see parks here. Um, when I think about healthy housing, I think about lead. I also think about safety. I think about safety in terms of the stairs, but I particularly think about safety in terms of violence prevention. And it seems to me that we should be dealing with the issues of environmental health and health more generally, and both as parts of environmental justice, um, focusing on the community environment in a more coherent way where you know, the way I like to describe it is a good solution will solve multiple problems. And the question is, um, what do we need to do to take the next steps? It's easy to say we need to collaborate. It's easy to, you know, talk about a specific program. And I'm thrilled at the level of collaboration in this administration. But I think we need to push the envelope. And I'd love to know what you think we need to do to push it further. Rashid. Um I'm Rajiv Bhatia. I'm a physician and I direct, have directed the environmental health programs in San Francisco since 1998. Um, the secretary, I think, um, uh, raised a very sort of important but you know, almost obvious question. Um, when we make decisions, we should be asking how they affect health. When we do things, we should be asking how we affect, they affect health. And um, it's, uh, it's surprising, and, and it's, it's wonderful to hear her say that. It's, it's also surprising that it's taken us so long, I guess, as a, as a society to uh, formally uh, recognize that we need to ask the questions. In fact, we asked those questions, um, we asked those questions in the National Environmental Policy Act. We asked those questions in the environmental ju justice. They're, they're the same questions, I think, we've been asking. I think part of the answer for us on next steps, and, and I, again, I'm speaking from the standpoint of a, a local public health agency, um, is to get to the truth is to get to the analysis in, in answering the question. And um, we were pushed on this issue by our local uh, uh, community organizations. They pushed the whole city government to do the com community impact analysis, social impact analysis, in the context of what was called smart growth development uh, in San Francisco in, uh, in response to the uh, boom. They were concerned about issues such as displacement and the lack of resor uh, resources and the displacement of, and the loss of jobs. Uh, and they wanted all that analysis done. And as we, as the health department, they came to us and asked us. And as we looked at it, we saw that 
all these rules and these mandates exist for doing, for, for doing the analysis, but that analysis wasn't being done. And in fact, methods existed for doing the analysis, and those methods weren't brought to the particular local decision-making context. And so um, one very simple thing we did is we dusted those methods off the shelf from where they exist in the research literature and the academic literature, and we brought them into local public health practice. Um, we, did, we did analysis that actually corroborated the community's claims, not on just issues of toxics, but on issues of, of the, the need for a, a community infrastructure. Um, this had an effect. It caused the, the fact that the, planning that the planning department was now hearing both from the health department and the community groups and was hearing the same methods um, uh, forced them more to take uh, notice. We were able to prevent displacement. We were able to make some pretty, together, some pretty substantial changes in, uh, in, in the planning process. So I think one of the key important lessons uh, in terms of next steps is that those, that, that analysis needs to be there and we, we need to sort of put it into the DNA of the system uh, on a regular basis. So it isn't going to be just dependent on who is there uh, r running the controls at the time, that that analysis needs to be sort of grounded and directed by community uh, groups. And we, I think we have some uh, great examples, uh, have been privileged to have some great examples of that in uh, San Francisco. We need to use, I think, um, uh, NEPA is a tool that is, um, uh, uh, and, and CEQA in California, the parallel tool, is a tool that's widely disparaged. And it's kind of funny that, that, that uh, these tools are often disparaged by the people who are in charge of doing them. Um, and that really, um, and, and, and that uh, doesn't make you feel very confident that they're going to be implemented uh, very well. Uh, and I, I'm speaking really, uh, uh, I don't know where I'm speaking about exactly. Um, but uh, the, the uh, but, but these, are, these are really, I mean, NEPA was a law written 40 years ago that really spoke to these issues. And now it really is about accountability and implementation, uh, not about a new, almost not really about a new policy. And I think that's a lot of what we're hearing. And maybe the final kind of, I mean, maybe a, um, a, another next step is that, Everything we're trying to analyze, health people typically look, wait for a problem to happen and then analyze it and say, oh, that's the cause of it. So everything we're trying to analyze prospectively, we, we should be able to put in as rules that govern the system, performance indicators of the DNA that kind of drives the system. And, I, and I'm really encouraged to hear the, what I'm hearing from HUD about how they're planning to do that is uh, really encouraging. And, and finally, it's, these collaborations are great, and, but from our experience, it takes more than simply the collaborations. The, the, uh, it's going to take advocates within the, within the system that are willing to push uh, against really rigid cultures and really rigid mindsets. Um, and it is, it is slow and patient work, and, and we do need uh, um, those who are in the, uh, not in the government to really push us from the left under, you know, uh, the, from push us from the outside. I, I want to get beyond left and right. It's like, it, it, this is not a left and right. It is not a left and right issue. It's a, it, they're, they're health issues. Um, but uh, understand that we're, we're also um, working to change a very large ship. Terry, do you want to? Yeah, I was just going to, um, I'm from uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration and Department of Health and Human Services. And I just wanted to underscore what um, you had to say, how important it is, um, you know, that, that we bring prevention um, into this, um, HRSA, just name of my agency, um, hadn't traditionally been um, as involved with the public health um, field. And in the last, um, I'd say, year or so, we've really um, moved more into that. We are very involved with a number one of these initiatives, including environmental justice. Um, HRSA is the safety net organization uh, for the nation. You all may be familiar with our um, agency because you have community health centers and we support those community health centers. So we're already in the communities um, and we've taken a, a different tact, a little different tact in that we want to um, to infuse more of the public health approach um, to um, our programs. So, I mean, HRSA is more than just the community health centers, but that's probably um, where you all are, are familiar um, with our agency. So I think what you said was really important, and I've seen a movement towards um, involving more of the agencies within HHS um, in this particular issue, which is good. Okay, why don't we take, uh, I'd like to take two questions, one from this side and one from this side, and then get answers from the panel, just to make sure that we're getting as many questions as possible. So, um, 
I don't know who over here. Uh, thank you. I'm Stephanie Tyree from West Virginia. Um, I wanted to address something that was said in an earlier panel, and I'll, I'll connect it to health, don't worry. But, um, you know, a panelist earlier said that we need to be patient, and I don't feel very patient right now, and I haven't heard anything today that makes me feel very patient. I've heard a lot of we're working on it, we're on it, and that to me doesn't mean anything. You know, you saying that you're in the communities, that means a little something, but I actually have never heard of your agency before or the communities, so. Have you heard of health centers, community health centers? Yeah, I have, but in my community, the community health centers are mm, deficient. So anyway, what I wanted to say is that I feel impatient because in my community, and I think in all of these communities, we're in a health crisis. I work with communities where they have red water coming out of their taps. And I know that that's not necessarily unusual, but it's unconscionable. People should not have to drink red water. And people should not have to drink red water for decades or for their entire lives. And we need health agencies to come in from the federal levels because on the state levels, our health agencies are doing nothing. They're not even looking at things that could be in the water. They're looking at E. coli and saying that the water is safe when there's heavy metals and other things in the water. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that we are dependent on federal agencies for funding of studies a lot of times. And for us in the communities, these studies are essential because our states tell us that things are safe unless we can show that they're not safe. You know, so we have coal slurry being injected underground in my community and our state says, well, we don't know that it's not safe, so we're not going to say that it's not, and that they let them do it. But to get a grant to study this at the federal level, you basically need a PhD. So I guess what I want to say to you is make the grants easier to get. You know, make the studies easier to get. The EPA has done work on this, but NIH, NIEHS needs to do work on that too because we need, we need you to come into our communities and help us. Okay, can we go over here, um, Penny? How about, um, do you have a question? My name is Penny Newman. I'm from Southern California with the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. We've been working on EJ for 33 years. Um, and when we were back in those days, we were told that the science wasn't there, that you had to have the science before we could do anything. We have the science now, and I don't know how many times we have to prove it over and over and over again before something gets done. Earlier we heard uh, from Chicago the problems with goods movement and the exposure of communities uh, to diesel. We're at the other end from California, and the San Bernardino Rail Yard is the, the hub that brings to you. Um, and yet we have the science telling us that diesel is deadly. It is killing us. And the only, the only response we get is, well, we'll put traps, we'll get clean trucks. There's no such thing. You know, we reduce the volume of the particulate matter, but the hazard is not being reduced. The deadly part is in the ultrafines and the aerosols, and the traps and the clean trucks and all of that do not address the ultrafines. So for the community, we are spending millions of dollars on a superficial um, approach when our communities are still dying. And we're told, well, look what we're doing for you. Well, it's not enough. In San Francisco, you may have the health department and the health people stepping forward. We don't all live in San Francisco. In our health department, they are not present in the discussion about goods movement or any of the other issues that affect our community. Yet this is a health issue. When you talk about EJ, that's the first thing that comes to people's mind is the health. That's why we're, we're out of our families spending all this time going to meetings is because we're concerned about our family's health. And yet the public health uh, agencies are not there. Mo goods movement is considered a commerce issue. Nowhere does the public health agency step in and voice their concerns. And so we are constantly on this battle. 
what are you as federal agencies going to do to step into specifically the goods movement industry, which is expanding? We are spending federal money, billions of dollars, on infrastructure to expand goods movement, not only to ports, and as the Panama Canal opens up, we're going to have more and more of that coming, but also inland, where they're putting the warehouses. And we see we have this huge health crisis occurring that is preventable, and we're not doing a damn thing about it. How are you going to help? Okay, so why don't we turn back to the panel? Um, who would like to address both of the questions that you uh, have heard? Can, can I just make one comment, the young woman? I don't know what organization you're from, but one of the things that you might want to do, I mean, I hear what you're saying about not having necessarily the research background, but you, you understand the research needs. I might suggest partnering with academia, um, to work with academia in order to be competitive for, no. Okay. One of the no well okay. one of the other things that that I uh, that I, I note that some of the health agencies are starting to do is that they're on their grants review pa panels they are putting people on those panels who are not necessarily PhD but people from communities to review the grants so that may be an opportunity for you to want to volunteer to be on these grants panels. I know HRSA does this a lot, and I've served on some of these grant panels where we have social workers, community organizers, and so on in order to review grants. Now, that does two things. Number one, it gives a different perspective on um, the uh, significance of the grants, but also the people who serve on these panels then learn what's, what gets funded so that when you go to write your grants, you know um, a little bit more, more knowledgeable about writing grants. So that so may I, be. So I, I think part of the question here is, and the statement is, if the paradigm doesn't change, if the criteria doesn't change, um, then our communities really don't get served. So I think many of us have gotten masterful, or we've rounded up people who are masterful, and we can write really good grant proposals and do good partnerships, but we still don't um, qualify qualify because we don't have all the letters after our names and all of that. And so, not to put words in Stephanie's mouth, but I think that the paradigm's got to shift. So if any of you have ideas about that framework changing, um, I think we'd love to hear that. I, I know one of the things we're doing uh, in, in terms of um, sort of building from the ground up is really beginning to think about funding what's called capacity building. I know that's sort of an ambiguous term, but capacity building down at the local level where the folks that are in the communities have the wherewithal. If that's grant writing, let's do that. You tell us what you, you need in terms of capacity. And it's that capacity that's needed at the core traditional delivery of basic, almost forgot about, traditional environmental health services. I mean, where are we when we're talking about just having clean water, safe food, just the basics for which we have tended to forget about? Um, we're talking about local public health departments, local environmental departments, local um, housing departments, all of us sort of working together at the grassroots with those core traditional services and building capacity at the local level. Um, we wanted to put sort of a sexy term and a sexy fling to it, but basic core capacity building is all we could think of um, at the local well, level. And we so, all understand so that. So we all know what that means. So, so that gives okay. people sort of a cachet of, of things to think about in terms of building capacity at the local level. So on to the second question. So Shelley? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the um, concerns that we have is that when we look at the evidence, um, where you live, your zip code, has a tremendous bearing on your life outcomes, your health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Deputy Sims is here and he'll speak more about that. And that has uh, had a profound shaping to our thinking about how we set the table for response to these complex issues. Um, you know, I'm from California, so I. I'm tracking what you're saying. And I think often 
you know, the decisions about transportation and goods movement are done in one group. The decisions about, you know, how we're going to solve our air quality problems and water quality problems are a different group. You know, housing and development and jobs are a completely different group. And we don't think that's a sustainable strategy. Um, at the federal level, we formed a partnership between Department of Transportation, Environmental Protection Agency, and Housing and Urban Development called the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. And we have within this uh, group a significant focus on environmental justice. Uh, trying to look at cross-cutting ways we can really att attack these issues. They are not single issue problems. Uh, and just a, you know, one example, we um, were able uh, with uh, 2010 funding that was appropriated from Congress to stand up a new uh, sustainable communities regional planning grant program. And the intent of this program was to tackle these issues in an integrated interdisciplinary cross-sector, you know, really bring all the players to the table. Um, we heard in so many places that there was just a disconnect between real measurement of outcomes and actual, you know, proposals, plans, investments on the ground. So we first asked all our grantees to provide data. We gave them the data. We asked them, take this data and really tell us how you're trying to integrate it in a common sense way. Frankly, the, the folks that won this grant competition were the ones that could really articulate how these data points affected all communities, particularly disadvantaged communities. The second thing that we've done is that we have embedded deep incentives for collaboration in both the kind of community engagement piece, but also in the governance structures of these grants processes so that we're ensuring that as this, you know, admittedly longer term strategy is stood up, um, we are able to build the capacity to ensure that we're, we're, we're actually dealing with the issues in a comprehensive way. So I think I, I want to try to answer Penny, your, your, your question. And I, and you you said what, you know, how can the federal, how can federal agencies go in and, um, get the local agent, local health departments, for example, to stand up and act up. And I, I guess I, I, I can't speak from the federal point, but I think I, I might have some suggestions just in terms of how to get local health agencies a little bit more mobilized and engaged. Um, you know, these you're, you're talking not about a scientific struggle, but I think you're talking about political struggle. And what I hear people asking for is um, the alliances with the health agency who, sh who should be the advocates and the defenders of health with you. Know, with you. Um, you, I think pressure, real pressure and political pressure needs to come to bear on local public health agencies at a local level when they do not meet uh, their mandates. That is what brought it, you know, we have a very, uh, our, our work in San Francisco did not, did not exist a while ago. It was community pressure that over time built uh, the demand and, and the, who we were hiring and what values those people had um, um, and, 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 and built that work. And that pressure, and it has to end, public health agencies often are, share values and are, are friends, but they need to be uh, often forced uh, uh, to come and, and, and to do these jobs, and then they'll come to love it, of course. Um, uh, but that, that, that really needs, I think, needs to happen, and, and really powerful things can happen working when, you, when those collaborations are, are developed. Um, for example, um, re, you know, the issue of uh, tra uh, pedestrian uh, fatalities was, uh, has been uh, raised in San Francisco. It wasn't an issue we were working on originally, but we could bring analysis to the table, and we were, for example, able to show that 50 percent of the injuries are suffered by 20 percent of the population, and it, and it allows us a, a reframing, a collective reframing of it, and, 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 and getting to everyone, you know, walking safely should be an environmental right, and, and so we're, it, I think public, 
public health can really, but they're going to need to be pushed off okay. into the table. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so so right. Eddie is going to go, and then we're going to do one. kind of, uh, Sokovi, you're going to go next, and then uh, <laughs> we're going to do um, a little lightning, okay? So we're going to get right to the point, and Sokovi's going to think about it and really model that, because we're going to do lightning round after this. Get right to the point, right after Eddie, so you're going to be um, and I'll the go model first. of brief. I'm going to get right to the point. From a political standpoint, since this was mentioned, I feel the, the burning need to say this. As uh, an organization that gets no government funding, I'm kind of liberated so I can say this. Uh, I, I want my brothers and sisters in the audience who are advocates to, we've not mentioned this at all today, and I'm shocked, but mostly because most of the folks up here have been, have been government employees and haven't, can't say this. These midterm elections mean there is a tidal wave of people coming to DC that don't want any government. And, and mind you, we're being live streamed right now, and some of them are watching us right now. So I just want folks to recognize that as impatient as you are, as we are, some of the changes that you're hearing about here is about changing the Titanic and shifting it, right? It doesn't happen quickly. And there are people on their way. I didn't turn it off. Somebody, see, they pulled the mic on me already. See, that's it. <laughs> see what I'm saying? My point is, is that a lot of these initiatives are threatened to be stillborn in the next Congress. So everybody that's here, be mindful when the congressional hearings come, when they start asking, what is EJ? What is this about? What is this preferential treatment? We got to get down and get busy. Because what you're hearing now is an attempt to go back against decades of injustice. Don't happen overnight. And already the attack is coming. Thank you. I'm going to pass my time to some advocates who haven't spoken yet. So, so for, okay, for the so folks, are you giving up the mic? Community, no, community members who haven't spoken yet, you can go ahead and take my time. You are a good man. Okay, over here. Hi, thank you. My name is Michelle Roberts, Advocates for Environmental and Human Rights. I'm going to make this fast. Um, I would like for you to help the folks in Bayview Hunters Point, um, San Francisco Health Department. They've been calling for you for a mighty long time, and unfortunately, the phone has not been answered, so we'd like for you to help them. Second, HRSA grant. We would like for you to help the community of Mossville, Louisiana. They applied for a grant. They have three times the amount of dioxin in their blood, and um, it's in there all throughout the, uh, their, 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 their uh, waterways, their houses, and everything. And they came to you, um, ATSDR, CDC, and, and you told them to fill out the HRSA grant, Stephanie, they filled the grant out, they got denied. They said it wasn't cost effective. They need health care in that community. They were or your original sustainable community. And lastly, to HUD, it is my fervent prayer that this sustainable community's development piece or whatever it is that you're calling it today is not a program that will push people out of their communities, people who have been living historically in some of, let's keep it real, some of these communities are near waterways and all the beautiful pathways that everybody wants to come back from the suburbs to be in. I live in Washington, D.C. and watching people be moved daily. So I'm hoping that this is not the new gentrifying wave, but I would like to know, A, are you going to help Bayview Hunters Point because they are pushing depleted uranium all around these babies while they're in school? B, what, how are we going to get free health services, not cost, free health services to Mossville, Louisiana? And C, is this sustainable communities piece going to be a piece that's not going to move people out of their communities, but b let them be the first line to have a green community like they've been asking for for well over 30 years? Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. with the beautiful uh, green jacket. Thank you. Oh, it was That's you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. What I wanted to say is, and that was great what you, you, you said. That was awesome. And I'm, in, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I, I live in a zip code that in the, the uh, 32206 zip code, we suffer with asthma and respiratory problems. And it's the highest in the whole state of Florida and with asthma and respiratory uh, um, problems. We uh, applied and wanted to apply for the um, um, HHS, the grant, but um, it's a challenge there because um, uh, it's 250 pages long. And, um, you know, I mean, 
that 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 that's my problem. And it, but but you know, you know, it, it, somewhere we have to have a happy medium here, you know, and say because now for the 250 page long, I can I can give you that information. It might not be the information you want, but for years and decades. <laughs> And, and for generations, I have enough information and documentation that would suffice that. But I, I said that to say this is that we need to make it more, you know, accommodatable uh, for the communities to be able to apply for these grants and, 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 and to address these issues because um, we're, we're not getting better. And I want to say this one, one more thing is that our commander in chief has done the right thing because our health care which he did in the beginning is the most important thing because when you go and everybody's saying a jobs 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 well if you go to a corporate if your health is not well if you're not well and you're not in good health no one is going to hire you because insurance companies are not going to give them the go ahead to do it. So if there's any question as to what we should be doing, we should be looking at the health care and the health issues of our community in these United States of America. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have some pretty specific questions that um, we want to get answered from these last two questioners. Michelle got three questions in, of course. <laughs> So, Terry, did you want to uh, answer one of those specific questions? Do you want to do A, B, C, G, L? Do you want to um, do that? I, I heard Bayview Hunter's point. Can you just restrict your answer to, to I, that, Reggie? I'm, I'm very happy to uh, talk with you about it. I think it's, uh, the, the issues have been reviewed at, at the local, state, and federal agent level by multiple agencies, and all the facts are uh, on the table. I'm very happy to go over them with you. Okay. And Mossville? Okay, yes, I don't know about specific communities, but I can tell you that the Affordable Care Act does um, call for $12.5 billion over the next five years for funding of community health centers and the National Health Service Corps, which is the loan repayment programs for practitioners, which brings practitioners into communities that are underserved. So there's currently, um, uh, over the course of the year, and you can look at the www.hersa.gov slash grants um, website to look for what are the active grants that are open right now with regard to community health centers. Um, there'll be more funding available as time goes on. We just closed um, one uh, grant program for new access points, which were to put um, more uh, community health centers um, across the country. So um, the money is coming, um, the opportunities are coming, and so I just look out for it. And, okay, thank you, Terry. And John's going to respond to the sustainable communities question. So, um, the work of uh, Department of Interior in these coming years, we heard, we did uh, 28 listening sessions around the country over the last year uh, in communities across the country, um, talking not only to adults, but we had 18 youth sessions as well. And we heard exactly what you said about investing in communities so that the people that live there can enjoy the benefits of this kind of development of parks and trails and riverfronts. So the people, not to move them out, but to, to really give them the benefits of all of these resources. So uh, the Secretary of Interior and I and others are focused on you know, rebuilding the Land and Water Conservation Fund and investing that in specific communities around the country to pr improve those parks and uh, open spaces. Okay, thank you. And so we have this uh, woman in the back with the blue um, sweater. Hello, my name is Jolanda Gonzalez. I'm the CEO of Nos Quedamos, and I am part of the New York Environmental Justice Alliance. I don't mean to be condescending or anything but, but when you tell me that I need to make another study on something else to tell me, to, to tell me that truck traffic gives asthma to my kids, how many ways does it have to be said before action becomes reality? I may not have a PhD in physics or in chemistry, but I do have a PhD in life. And for every family of four, three have asthma. Children go next to schools, next to highways. How many different ways are we going to say the same thing over and over and over again? 
It's enough with the studies and start applying the studies to real legislation in order to get what we need done in our communities. There is no other way of putting it. Thank you. Okay. And on this side, this woman right here. Thank you. Is it on? My name is Ann Joyner, and I'm president of Cedar Grove Institute for Sustainable Communities. I have a couple of quick suggestions I hope you will give some thought to. Um, first is real easy. If you all would consider giving your email out of all of the panelists all day long so that people that don't get to make comments can reach you with their comments. Uh, the second is that the EPA gives out small community grants. They need to be easier to apply for. They need to be, their needs, they need to be better funded and every single other agency in the federal government needs to have EJ grants available as well, especially HUD, but all of them. Um, and re regarding water quality, water contamination results right now are not accessible to the public in many, many uh, places. They are not aggregated. They're not given by what uh, the water supply is. So you can't look at what's happening um, for a particular water supplier. And that needs to change, and that's within your purview to change. So I hope you will think about that. Um, somebody said earlier um, that, I think it was, uh, you were trying to model best practices. That assumes that local governments are proactive in trying to help uh, the communities we're talking about and not just help them disappear. And I would like to know if you can come up with some incentives, um, yeah, carrot and or stick, so that that won't be the case. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any responses here? Should we keep moving? Yeah, no, with I'd, like to, okay. I'd like to mention a couple of things. Um, I came from the advocacy world before I went into to federal service. And um, I have experienced firsthand the unbelievably frustrating system that exists to access federal funding for a whole range of purposes, studies or um, actual investments that are different from the norm. Um, and in my case, uh, I ran a, a, an NGO, a 501c3 organization, which in many, many cases is not considered an eligible recipient of a lot of different kinds of federal funds. Um, and I feel that as we move forward, we have got to really listen to the challenges that people have about trying to work with the federal government and have the federal government be a more responsive partner to you. When um, HUD stood up its uh, Sustainable Communities Program, uh, like uh, the, the National Park Service, we also went around and listened to what people said before we defined the criteria for the program. I'm really proud of that, in part because it turns out that HUD had never done that before. That seems like such an obvious thing to do, ask people what it should be and use that information to devise the criteria for the program. We also tried extremely hard to make the criteria for our competition simple and easy. And it's really hard to do that within the context of the federal government. We're trying, but it is, I don't think we're anywhere near close to getting that, that system right. I do think that the more that we can maintain an open line of communication to practitioners, to advocates in communities, we can you know, continue to change to be better partners. Um, I think that at least from HUD's perspective, we are not trying to dictate what communities should should do with our funding, but we are trying to set a very high bar, says 
you know, we want green and sustainable communities for all people. It should not result in displacement. Um, we need to make some fundamental changes to the ways that our funding is utilized at the local level. Um, but we also need to rely on the coalitions at the local level to make sure that that really happens. The federal government isn't very good at working at the local level, and we need to find some new ways in which we can um, enable the good work that you are talking about here. Okay, so this has been a great discussion. Thank you. We have time for two more questions, and I'm going to ask that folks who have just who have not had an opportunity to talk at all. So, um, in the back here. I'm Robin Morris Collin. I am the first law professor to teach sustainability in the United States, just published an encyclopedia on the topic. No. And I would like to say that there is an unfortunate, deliberate color line between sustainability and environmental justice. And that color line isn't green. Mm -hmm. And every time sustainability is talked about at the federal level, and every time the federal government gives money for sustainability to be discussed at the local level, Environmental justice has to be there or it's not sustainable. That's right. There That's is right. no sustainability without justice. There is no sustainable society without justice. And it shouldn't be an add-on. It is not a postscript to any chapter. It's an essential part of sustainability. Point two, <laughs> collaboration requires competence. And yes. collabor That's right. collaborating with people who do not understand environmental justice wastes our time, sets us back, distracts us, and does all sorts of other bad things. So in terms of collaboration and partnership, I would ask all of you federal government officials to make environmental justice competence part of your requirements. Otherwise, you're wasting our time. Yeah. Last point. Building capacity at the local level is important, and you do that by funding operations and not just projects. The kinds of organizations that need to be there are not going to be able to survive unless you fund their operations. And we need more of that money and not just project-based operational money. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Very good. Here. Um, my name is Barbara Miller, and I come from the um, Bunker Hill Superfund site. In 1983, it was designated the second largest NPL site in the nation of 21 square miles. In 2000, it was extended to, or yeah, 21 square miles. In 2000, it was extended to 1,500 square miles. There's approximately 500,000 um, people who are affected. I live in the epicenter of the site in a company town uh, which I believe needs to be dealt with, you know, within EPA's whole cultural protocol because until somebody has actually lived in a company town in a very isolated, um, poor community, you have no idea what it's like to go up against, um, let's say, obstacles. Um, there's six generations in my community living with chronic lead and heavy metal contaminated um, health problems. In 1999, there were 90 pages of titles of health studies done at the site and more coming every day that all lend to the, the realization that the, the pollution and the contamination is causing these health problems. We have a local health director who um, research papers have been written by lead experts like John Rosen and Bruce Lanfear and Herbert Needleman who um, vividly point out the conflict of interest that he has with the special interests and whatever we do we can't get beyond that um, part of it is we don't want to be seen as fighting within our community we want to work things out and it's not going to happen um, last year in the community there are 8,000 or in the whole Superfund site 8,000 Medicaid children um, that's mandated by law to be lead tested for lead and last year, I think there was uh, uh, about 100 of them tested with elevated levels still being shown. Um, we need engagement in our community, and we need help with lead health intervention and education and our outreach. 
I've been patient. I've been doing this for 24 years. And we need help with funding, uh, ways to work out that, um, you know, open line of communication that you're talking about, but it's going to have to come from um, national oversight and assistance to break that cycle that's going on in not only my community, but I know this is going on in other areas. And we need funding, and we can write grants, but they're not going to get funded as long as that, you know, that uh, conglomerate uh, conflict of interest exists there. Um, we just, uh, I'll tell you, lead exposure is one of the best kept secrets to the citizens in, in my community, and it's the nation's largest lead Superfund site. So before I go, I really would like to have, it's a long ways from Idaho, it was hard to get here, I had to raise the money myself. I'd like to have some commitment from someone here at this conference to um, you know, assist us with these needs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any responses here? Or can we keep going? We, get, we actually have bonus time, so I'm gonna go back over here, Mark. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Mark Mitchell with the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice. And uh, since the session is to talk about place-based issues, uh, it just seems to me that, that the federal government has information, health information, about um, everybody uh, around the country, that there have been a number of studies um, around the country, or if there hasn't been, then there should be. There should be basic information on every uh, census tract or census block group in the country, basic health information. And we shouldn't have to wait for communities to come up and say, we think that our community has a higher level of um, health problems, um, uh, where in, particularly in communities that are, that are um, intimidated, where, where they can be intimidated easily, or, and communities that are unempowered. There should be basic health information for every census block group in the United States, and the federal government should be able to identify the communities that have the highest levels of, um, of health effects. Um, and they should also be looking at things like chemicals, chemical policy. There, um, you know, you heard about Mossville, you heard about um, other places around the country where there is a large concentration of uh, petrochemical facilities, uh, other chemical facilities. Um, and in our community in Hartford, um, we, we are on the other, other end of that process, of the chemical process. And right now, chemicals um, are not tested for health effects before they're put into uh, consumer products. Out of the 84,000 chemicals that are registered with the EPA as potentially being used in consumer products, they've only request, been able to request information on 200 of those chemicals and have been only able to um, restrict the use of five of those chemicals in the last 34 years. Um, there's, there's got to be a way to, um, uh, to look at, uh, to change the federal legislation, uh, to look at uh, how chemicals are affecting our communities, to make sure that these things are safe. That when, I, when, when you go into the store um, and you see um, a, a products on the, on the shelf, that, that, that you know which ones are dangerous, which ones are safe, um, and that you um, could be allowed to choose which ones are safe, or even better yet, to ban the dangerous ones from being on the shelf in the first place. Um, so, so I'd like um, if, to see if you can address those issues. Thank you. Beverly, you want to get the last question? Last statement? Just listening to all of this since I was involved in that body burden study, I should be glowing right now based upon the results, but I'm somehow still here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I am glowing, but yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, to get to the point, uh, in in dealing with uh, strategic planning uh, within the interagency work groups, I just want to emphasize that uh, climate justice and climate adaptation needs to be a part of that planning. I'm certain that when we did this years ago, we did not do that. This was not on our minds. But increasingly, I believe it's going to be an issue. And I want to use the Gulf Coast just as an example. Um, the recovery process has been so racist in design in every area, from um, having access to hospitals, living in an area with 60,000 people, we have no hospitals. And one of the things that we were told was that 
because of the new system with all of the uh, neighbor, neighborhood clinics, health centers, that's a good reason for us not to get a hospital because of the number of beds that are going to be allowed. You cannot believe the kinds of responses we've gotten to getting hospital, to getting a hospital. And this is a black community that was thriving before the storm. So certainly income uh, means nothing if you're black or brown or whatever. It has carried no weight. So we have no parks. We have no hospitals. We have no grocery stores. We didn't have uh, good levy protection. We're fighting for that in every way. And this is in an area where black people were looking at second generation um, uh, inheritance of housing and property. So we've lost financially, we've, we've lost, you know, our, our inheritance is gone. And they're trying to kill us. And now all of the new, <laughs> they are. I really believe they're trying to kill us. They, they are try now trying to bring all of this new technology for dealing with waste. And where do they want to put it? Where we live. And so, I'm, I mean, I don't know how to respond. We're fighting. I'm tired. You know, I'm getting old. But I, I'm, I'm going to fight until the end. I'm looking to the um, in, environmental justice part of EPA to respond to some of these, uh, some of our complaints. Don't forget all the toxins that were left after the storm. Everybody else has forgotten it. But we know that it's still there. Superfund sites where people are now moving back in those areas. So you, we're dealing with so many things that it's exhausting. Uh, climate justice and cli as it relates to climate adaptation needs to be a part of the strategic plan. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. Lunch sure didn't slow us down. And we are off to our next panel. Thanks so much. And thanks to this panel. I'm s sorry. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nice job moderating. No. It's like they're swooping in here. Okay. Um, we have a um, sustainable community partnership in National City. You know that. Yeah. So um, it's great. It is great. But but it's a great. I think it's starting to so. more, more, yeah. more. No, no, but I mean, can I give you something to take? Oh, sure. Oh, Thanks. after Westchester. Okay. I mean, can, can we can we all get to see it too? Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're we're ready to move on to the next section. All right, everybody, we're going to get ready for our next speaker. So if everybody can remain seated, that'll be fantastic. Jolene is going to actually speak. So please, everyone, please be seated. Can we get everybody to be seated? That'll be fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. So we're going to start once again. Thank you very much. Here is Jolene. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> we certainly want our secretaries to say hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, let's get this show on the road. Are you all familiar with the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? You guys all know about that? It's a trivia game based on the assumption that within six steps, any individual can be linked to a film role by Kevin Bacon. Well, in Indian country, we have something similar to that, except it's more like two degrees of separation. And that always starts off with, where are you from and who's your family? Within these two questions, one can determine your extended family lineage, including ex relationships, <laughs> your tribal affiliation, and how you are connected to that person. So I'll go ahead and start. My name is Jolene Catron, and I am originally from New Mexico. Um, and I am Laguna and Zuni on my mom's side and Navajo um, on my dad's side. I currently live and work as executive director of Wind River Alliance within and around the Wind River Indian Reservation in West Central Wyoming, which is home to the Eastern Shoshone and the Northern Arapaho people who are my in-laws. Those of you who know Central Wyoming know that it is the area, that the area is a place of stunning beauty, abundant wildlife, but harsh cold winters, 
and independent, humble people. That is not to say we don't have our challenges, especially around historical issues of environmental injustices and government-to-government -government relationships. It is my honor to have been asked to introduce two people whose leadership and decisions greatly impact the day-to-day -day workings of my existence and that of other tribal environmental leaders. Heroes to me, like the Wilaya Johns, Anthony Oldmans, Silver Hanways, and Peter Captains of Indian Country, whose leadership and community organizing go beyond mere techniques of survival, but also promote prosperity of our resilient communities in the face of devastating environmental cultural impacts and, excuse me, devastating environmental and cultural impacts from climate change. Secretary Ken Salazar is a fifth generation Coloradan. As with my family, Ken's family settled in the American West before the United States was a country. After settling in New Mexico four centuries ago, his family planted roots in Colorado's San Luis Valley, which I might add is within the four sacred mountains of the Navajo, where his family has farmed and ranched the same land for five generations. Secretary Salazar was raised on a remote ranch without electricity or a telephone. And I would imagine it's very similar to that of my grandfather's house where he also had to haul his water. And where I might also add again, where many na native people today have homes that still exist without electricity and running water. Ken Salazar was confirmed as the 50th Secretary of the United States Department of the Interior on January 20th, 2009. He has served as Colorado's 35th U.S. Senator winning election in November 2004 and serving on the Finance Committee, which oversees the nation's tax, trade, social security, and health care systems. He also served on the Agricultural, Energy, and Natural Resources, Ethics, Veterans Affairs, and Aging Committees. In addition, I'd like to introduce Janet Napolitano. She is the third secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and is leading our nation's collective efforts to secure our country from threats we face, from terrorism to natural disasters. Like me, Janet Napolitano spent part of her youth in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So that makes us homegirls. <laughs> she also previously served as governor of Arizona. Secretary Napolitano has strengthened our nation's ability to prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters by cutting through red tape and expediting decision making along the Gulf Coast, providing new resources to build resilient communities and bolster their response cap capabilities, and calling on all Americans to play a role in the shared responsibility of making our homeland secure. It is my honor to introduce Secretaries Ken Salazar of the Department of Interior and Janet Napolitano of the Department of Homeland Security. How's everybody this afternoon? Let me tell you, I'm honored to be here with uh, Secretary Napolitano because uh, she's been a long advocate of the issues that you are all here uh, gathered to talk about today, and so I'll get a chance to introduce her in just a few minutes. My remarks are short here at the beginning as uh, you move forward on uh, this next panel, but I want to say first that environmental justice is really an issue for all of us. Uh, there is no one uh, who doesn't have a place at the table when we talk about environmental justice. For me, it's a real issue when I have, uh, you know, I come from a place which is uh, far removed from uh, any big city way south of, uh, of Denver, Colorado. And I saw the differences uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of uh, issues that uh, we had to deal with as I was growing up relative to environmental justice. and. Later on in life, uh, dealing with uh, sites that had been uh, contaminated by super fun kinds of activities and knowing the communities who lived in all these brown fields kinds of places, uh, you see what, how the, the, the history of this country um, really has been a, a, a country that has developed and the communities that have been affected in so many ways and have had to bear the costs of these ex externalities have really been mostly the minority communities and the poorer communities. And, that's true whether it's in the state of Colorado or whether it's uh, in the state of New York or anywhere else around the country. And so 
having uh, the focus on environmental justice and having a group of you gathered right here in the White House uh, with the President telling all of you and telling all of us in his administration that environmental justice is a high priority is something uh, whose time has come and something that I am very proud of. Many years ago, in uh, 1990, I became the executive director of the uh, Department of Natural Resources. And at the time, uh, all of the 10 division directors of my department were white. And most of those who were involved in natural resources issues, there was so uh, little diversity. So I pulled together a conference in Colorado that was titled uh, Minorities in the Environment. And that was essentially the headline in the Rocky Mountain News of that time. Uh, that we needed to do a lot better in my view, uh, being then the cabinet member in Colorado and doing outreach to minority communities and getting them involved in hunting and fishing and in the outdoors and then protecting our environment and doing all the things that we all care about. But the fact is that um, some things have changed. It's a, an issue which is on a higher priority for people, uh, but it's also an issue where we have a long ways to go. John Jarvis, who uh, spoke to you in the earlier panel, he and I have a conversation about this, and indeed in his plan for 2011, uh, one of our big issues is working on diversity and working on inclusion. For me, it affects me because I notice it, maybe as a member of, the, of a minority community being Latino. When I go to a place like Yellowstone and I look at the faces of the people who are visiting one of the iconic natural wonders of uh, our planet and seeing that there is so lack uh, so, so little diversity in terms of the people who are there. So we know we still have a lot of work to do in all of our agencies, but we are uh, very committed to moving forward with uh, an environmental agenda that makes uh, tremendous sense. I would expect that in the months ahead, uh, part of what you will see coming from us um, and coming from the administration will be a great focus on uh, urban parks and urban wildlands, and that's because our world has changed so much from where it was 100 years ago. Our uh, people now live in the big cities. And so how we put the spotlight on urban parks is uh, a challenge which the President has given to all of us. And working with Lisa Jackson and Nancy Sutley and my colleague Tom Vilsack uh, at the Department of Agriculture, we will be rolling out a report for the President that I expect will have a significant chapter on urban parks. Uh, secondly, youth. Uh, we need to do a lot better job in terms of connecting up young people to the outdoors. Uh, this summer, as uh, Tom Strickland, John Jarvis, and so many people from the administration went around the country to over 30 communities to have listening sessions with young people as well as not so young people talking about what we ought to do with America's great outdoors. But we've heard from young people, and uh, many young people with uh, diverse faces like we see here today, is that they needed to have places in the outdoors to go and to play and to be able to access places that were safe uh, for them to uh, stay healthy. And uh, in the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, where uh, John took me to one of the programs that we have developed there in partnership with the local community, I was amazed at the number of people from East LA who frankly were out there in the Santa Monica Mountains where we had given them a job and their lives had been transformed because of the fact that they had been exposed to a great experience uh, in the outdoors. Uh, young people who had been members of gangs who had been for the first time coming out to the outdoors and all of a sudden seeing an opportunity for them to become wildlife biologists or park rangers or other kinds of things that relate to nature. Uh, in our own time, in the last two years from January uh, 2009 until now, within the Department of Interior, uh, we started what was start, uh, became the uh, a 21st Century uh, uh, a Youth Conservation Corps program uh, and with the President's uh, support and, and direction and, and helping for the budget. we. Uh, have moved from essentially having very few young people working in the Department of Interior. We're now across all the different bureaus of Interior. We will have hired by the end of 2010 over 20,000 young people who are working with us at Interior. And it's a diverse group of people and we do it, one, because these are going to be the next generation of conservation leaders in America. Number two, they're going to be the next employees of the Department of Interior because between now and the year 2016, about 40 percent of the employees within Interior will retire. And so we need to have that next generation of people coming up through the workforce. And we are absolutely committed that that next generation looks like the face of America and not like the face of exclusion, which uh, has been a large part of the history of the Department of, of, of Interior. Finally, um, I, I guess two more points. One is, um, you know, in my own role as uh, Secretary of Interior, um, I often remember Senator Danny Inouye, who uh, is forever a champion of diversity and a champion of uh, the history of, uh, of this country. 
and describing my job to me in uh, the early days after uh, President Obama asked me if I would leave the Senate to take this position. And he said to me, uh, you got to remember that as Secretary of Interior, you ha have a very important job uh, because you are the custodian, yes, of America's natural resources, but you're also the custodian of America's story, of America's history. And through the National Park Service and through other units that we have in the Department of Interior, we have a major responsibility to tell the story of all of America. And so when we uh, open up the Martin Luther King Memorial on the Mall in this next year, or when we uh, celebrate the commemoration of uh, the birth home of Martin Luther King in Atlanta, Georgia, or the trails uh, of uh, agony which uh, were walked by Native Americans in our history, or the trails uh, on behalf of uh, farm workers which are walked uh, by Cesar Chavez in Arizona and in California, we are uh, telling America's story. And the fact of the matter is that uh, we have to recognize that America's story has not been told in the way that it should have been told because it has not been complete. So one of the challenges that the President has given to me, which I have given to uh, Director John Jarvis and to the rest of our agencies, is that we tell that story in its full breadth, uh, that women are not left out, African Americans are not left out, Native Americans are not left out, Hispanics are not left out, no one is left behind. And that is part of the responsibility which we take on in the ambit of environmental justice. And the final point I would make, we have a very important responsibility with respect to the nation-to-nation -nation re relationship uh, for uh, Native Americans, 564 tribes uh, federally recognized around this country as well as Alaska Natives. And this president uh, said at the beginning that what we would do was to turn a new page in history uh, on the relationship that we have with Native Americans. And just in the last few days, we were here as the president signed uh, legislation that dealt with uh, four very significant uh, water rights settlements in Montana, New Mexico, and Arizona, which had been in 100 years of litigation, and we were able to bring those to an end. And we were able to bring to an end uh, the Cobell litigation, which had been an albatross around the relationship between uh, the United States of America and Indian country. And by the way, along that same effort, we put together the coalition uh, with uh, the uh, Black Caucus and uh, African American farmers to move forward and settle the Pickford case to do it to deal with that injustice which had been around for a very long time. So, in all that, uh, I think what you see is a President uh, Obama who uh, I have known for a long time and who has been absolutely committed to diversity and making sure that we have an inclusive America. And that to me is what environmental justice is very much about. And I am very fortunate to have uh, a uh, number of uh, a, a, a colleagues on the cabinet, all of whom are committed to those same principles of uh, diversity and inclusiveness and, and environmental justice. And I can't think of uh, a better person to be an advocate on those issues uh, than my friend now for over 10 years, whom I have known uh, from her young days as a very young attorney general in the state of Arizona to now serving on the governor's cabinet and protecting our homeland every day. And that's the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano.